My Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. My Ishmael is the third book of the Ishmael series, starting with Ishmael, then Story of B, then My Ishmael. Part 1. Hello there. I think it's pretty lousy to wake up at age 16 and realize you've already been screwed. Not that there's anything terrifically unusual about getting screwed at this age. It seems like everyone inside 50 miles is bent on doing you in. But not many 16-year-olds get screwed in this particular way. Not many have the opportunity to get screwed this way. I'm grateful. I really am. But this is not about me at age 16. This is about something that happened when I was 12. That was a painful time in my life. My mother was deciding she might as well go ahead and be a drunk. In the previous three or four years, she wanted me to think she was just a social drinker. But she figured I know the truth by now, so why go on pretending? She didn't ask my opinion about it. If she had, I would have said, Please go on pretending, Mom, especially in front of me, okay? But this isn't a story about my mother. It's just, you have to understand some of this if you want to understand the rest. My parents were divorced when I was five. I won't bore you with that story. I don't even know that story. Really, because mom tells it one way and dad tells it another. Sound familiar? Anyway, dad remarried when I was eight. Mom almost did the same, but the guy turned out to be a creep, so she skipped it. Along about in there, she started putting on weight big time. Luckily, she already had a good job. She heads up the word processing operation at a big law firm downtown, and then she took to stopping for a drink after work. This got to be a pretty long stop. All the same, she rolled out of bed every morning at 7.30, no matter what, and I think she made it a rule not to start drinking before the end of the business day, except on weekends, of course, but I won't go into that either. I was not a happy girl. In those days, I thought it might help if I played the dutiful daughter. When I got home from school, I tried to put the house back to the way Mom would have wanted it if she cared anymore. Mostly this meant cleaning up the kitchen. The rest of the house stayed pretty neat, but neither of us had time to tackle the kitchen before heading off to work in school. Anyway, one day I was gathering up the newspaper. Something in the want ad section caught my eye. It read, Teacher seeks people. Must have an earnest desire to save the world. Apply in person. This was followed by a room number in the name of a ratty old office building downtown. It struck me as weird that a teacher would be seeking a pupil. It just didn't make any sense. The teachers I know, seeking a pupil would be like a dog seeking a flea. Then I took another look at the second sentence. Must have an earnest desire to save the world. I thought, wow, this guy doesn't want much. The crazy thing was that this teacher ought to be pitching his services like everyone else. And he wasn't. It was like a help wanted act. It was like the teacher needed the pupil, not the other way around. A shiver started at the back of my neck and the hair stood up all over my head. Wow, I said, I could do this. I could be this guy's pupil. I could be useful. Something like that. It sounds silly now, but this ad hooked into my dreams. I knew where the building was and all I had to remember was the room number. But I tore the ad out anyway and put it in a drawer in my room. That way if I fell down, hit my head, and became an amnesiac, I'd still find it sitting there someday. It must have been a Friday night, because the next morning I lay in bed thinking about it. Having a daydream about it, actually. I'll get to the daydream later. Room 105. The good news was that Mom didn't try to keep me on a short leash. She didn't keep herself on a short leash. So maybe she figured she had no business keeping me on one. Anyway, after breakfast I told her, I'm going out. And she said, okay, not, where are you going? Or, when will you be back? Just, okay. I took a bus downtown. We live in a pretty decent little city. I'm not going to say where exactly. You can stop at a red light without getting carjacked. Drive-by shootings are rare, no snipers on the roofs, like that. So I didn't give a second thought to going downtown on a Saturday morning by myself. I knew the building mentioned in the ad, it was the Fairfield. A loser uncle of mine once had an office there. He chose it because it was in a good location but cheap. In other words, crummy. 
The lobby brought back memories. It looked just the way it smelled, like wet dogs and cigars. It took me a while to figure out where to go. There was just one bank of offices on the ground floor, and room 5 wasn't in it. I finally found it at the back by the loading dock, facing the freight elevator. I said to myself, this can't be right, but there it was, room 105. I said to myself, what am I doing here anyway? This door's not going to be unlocked on a Saturday, but it was. I walked into this huge, empty room. Then I took in a lungful of air and was almost knocked down. It wasn't wet dogs and cigars this time, it was zoo. I didn't mind that. I liked zoos. But as I said, the place was empty. There was one sagging bookcase over at the left and one overstuffed chair over at the right. They looked like leftovers from a garage sale or something. I said to myself, this guy has moved out. I looked around again, at the high dirty windows overlooking the alley, at the dusty industrial lights hanging from the ceiling, at the peeling walls, the color of pus. Then I said to myself, Okay, I'll move in. I think I meant it. Nobody could possibly want this place, could they? So why should I have it? I mean, it only had a chair, didn't it? I could do without the rest for a while. There was one feature I hadn't figured out. The chair was facing a big sheet of dark glass in the middle of the right-hand wall. It reminded me me of the kind of window witnesses look through to identify suspects in a police lineup. There had to be a room behind it because there was a door beside the window. I went over to have a look. I put my nose up against the glass and used my hands to block out the light and I thought it was a movie. About ten feet back from the glass there was sitting this great huge fat gorilla munching on a tree twig. He was staring right back at me and I suddenly knew it was not a movie. Yo! I said and jumped back. I was startled, but not exactly scared. It seemed like I should be scared. I mean, I knew I'd be screaming my head off if I was a character in a movie, but the gorilla was just sitting there. I don't know. Maybe I was just too dumb to be scared. All the same, I did look over my shoulder to make sure I had a clear shot at the door. Then I slanted my eyes in to see if the gorilla was staying put. He was. He wasn't even quivering, or I would have been out of there. Alright, I had to put this all together. The teacher had not moved out. I mean, no one could move out of a place and forget to take his gorilla along, so the teacher had not moved out. Maybe he just stepped out for lunch or something, and forgot to lock his door. Or something. The teacher would soon be back. Probably. Maybe. I looked around again. I still tried to figure out what the deal was here. The room, the room I was in was not a living space. No bed, no kitchen, no facilities, no storage space for clothes or anything. So the teacher didn't live there. But obviously, the gorilla lived there. In the room on the other side of the glass. Why? How come? Well, what the hell. I guess you can keep a gorilla if you want to. But why keep a gorilla this particular way? I looked in again and noticed something I'd missed the first time. It was a poster on the wall behind the gorilla. It said, With man gone, will there be hope for gorilla? Well, I said to myself, That's an interesting question. It didn't seem like a very hard one, though. Even at age 12, I knew what was going on in the world. The way we were going, gorillas were not going to be around for very much longer. So the answer was yes, with man gone, there would be hope for Gorilla. The ape in the next room grunted, just as if he didn't think much of my reasoning. I wonder if the poster was part of the course. The ad in the newspaper said, must have an earnest desire to save the world. That made sense. Saving the world would certainly mean saving gorillas, but not saving people? That's what popped into my head. You know what it's like to have ideas pop into your head? It's like they come from out of the blue. But this one came from outer space. I mean, I can tell strangers from friends. This was a stranger. I gave the ape a look. The ape gave me a look. And I knew. I vanished from that place. That's how fast I got out of there. One second I was the eyeing the gorilla, and the next I was standing out on the sidewalk, breathing hard. I wasn't far from the center of town, where a couple of department stores are still hanging on by their fingernails. I headed there. 
where I'd find some people. I wanted to be around people while I thought about this. The gorilla had talked to me, inside my own head. That was what I had to think about. I didn't have to wonder if it happened. It happened. I couldn't make up something like that. And why would I make up something like that? To fool myself? I went over all this while riding the escalators at Pearson's. Six floors up, six floors down. Very soothing. Nobody cares. Nobody bothers you. Nobody notices. At the bottom, you have to switch from down to up, jewelry and notions, women's clothing, men's clothing, housewares, toys, furniture. At the top, you have to switch from up to down, furniture, toys, houseware, men's clothing, women's clothing, jewelry and notions, all coming at you in a restful slow motion. Teacher seeks pupil, must have an earnest desire to save the world. I say, you mean save the world as in gorillas, and the gorilla says, but not people. Where was the teacher while all this was going on? And what would it have gone on if the teacher had been there? What was the plan? What was the idea? I could see an exotic teacher having an exotic pet, a mind-talking ape, pretty exotic, yeah. Teacher seeks pupil, must have an earnest desire to save the world and be able to put up with a telepathic ape. Hey, that was me, down to a T. I stopped for a coke, it wasn't even noon yet. I take on the ape. When I got back to room 105, I put a hand to the doorknob and an ear to the wood, and heard a man's voice, and heard a man's voice. I couldn't make out what he was saying. He was yards away from the door, and facing the wrong way. At least, that's the way I pictured it. Bumble, 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 he said. Bum, bumble, bumble, bumble. Silence. A full minute of silence. Bum, bumble, bumble, bum, the man went on. Bum, bum, bumble, bum, bumble. And so on. Exciting listening. It went on and on. I thought of just walking in. It was an appealing idea. As an idea. I thought of coming back later. But that wasn't even an appealing idea. Who knew what I might miss? I hung in. The minutes dragged by like rainy afternoons. I put that in writing assignment once. The minutes dragged by like rainy afternoons. The teacher wrote, good, in the margin. What a creep. Suddenly, the man's voice was right by the door. I don't know, he was saying. I really don't, but I'll give it a try. I scurried across the hall and put my back against the free elevator door. Another minute passed. The man said, okay, and opened the door. He stepped out into the hall, saw me, and froze for a second, as if I was a cobra posed to strike. Then he decided to pretend I wasn't there. He closed the door behind him and started to walk away. I said, are you the teacher? From the way he frowned at me, you would have thought this was a real hard question. Finally, he got his wits together and figured out what he wanted to say. He drew himself up and said, no. Obviously, he wanted to say a lot more, maybe thousands of words more, but that was all he could manage at the moment. No. I said very politely, thank you. He frowned some more, turned away, and stumped off. At school, any guy you don't like is a dork, but dork isn't a word I use all that much. I guess I like to save it for special people, like this guy. This guy was a dork. I took an instant dislike to him. I don't know why. About my mother's age, dressed cheap and ugly. One of those dark, intense, if you know what I mean. I swear, I never knew what a bad haircut looked like till I saw his. He had intellectual keep your distance written all over him. I gave my attention to the door in front of me. I couldn't think of anything that needed thinking about. So I just went through it. Nothing had changed, but it was all different now because I understood what the deal was. What I'd heard through the door was a conversation between the dork and the ape. 
Naturally, I only heard the dork side because the ape wasn't talking out loud. The dork wasn't the teacher, therefore the ape was the teacher. There was one more thing, the dork wasn't afraid. This was important. It meant the ape wasn't dangerous. If a dork didn't have to be afraid, I didn't have to be afraid. Now that I knew he was there, it was easy to spot the gorilla behind the glass. He was right where I'd left him. I said to him, I came because of the ad. Silence. I thought maybe he hadn't heard me. I moved up to the chair and said again. The ape stared at me in silence. What's the matter? I said. You talked to me before. He closed his eyes very, very slowly. It's not easy to close your eyes that slowly. I thought maybe he was falling asleep or something. What's the matter? I said. The ape sighed. I don't know how to describe a sigh like that. I expected to see the walls bending under the weight of that sigh. I waited. I figured he was getting ready to speak, but after a full minute, he was still just sitting there. I said, didn't you put the ad in the paper? He squeezed his eyes shut as if to blot out all this unpleasantness. All the same, he finally opened his eyes and spoke. As before, I heard it in my head, not in my ears. I put the ad in the paper, he admitted, but not for you. What do you mean, not for me? I didn't see anything that air that said, this ad is for everyone but Julie Gercheck. I'm sorry, he said. I should say I didn't put the ad in the paper for children. Children? This really made me mad. <laughs> you call me children? I'm 12 years old. I'm old enough to steal cars. I'm old enough to have an abortion. I'm old enough to deal crack. This great huge fat ape began to writhe i swear to god wow i was really getting off on this i was beating up on a thousand pound gorilla he writhed for a while then he began to get a new grip on things he calmed down and started talking i'm sorry i tried to dismiss you so easily he said clearly you're not a dismissible person However, the fact that you're old enough to steal cars is not relevant here. Go on, I told him. I'm a teacher, he said. I know that. As a teacher, I'm able to help certain kinds of pupils. Not every kind. I can't help someone with chemistry or algebra or French or geology. I didn't come here for anything like that. These are examples only. What I mean is that I can only offer a certain kind of teaching. So, what are you saying? Are you saying I don't want that certain kind of teaching? He nodded. That's what I'm saying. The teaching I'm able to offer is in a kind that will be helpful to you. Just yet. In a split second, my eyes were burning with tears. I certainly wasn't going to let him see them. You're just like everyone else, I told him. You're a liar. That made his eyebrows stood up. A liar? Yes. Why don't you tell the truth? Why don't you say you're just a kid, no use to anybody, come back in ten years, then maybe it'll be worth my time. Say that and you won't hear another word out of me. Say that and I'll turn around and go home. He sighed again, even deeper than before. Then he nodded, just once. You're perfectly correct, he said. I was telling a lie. I was expecting you not to see through it. Please accept my apology. I nodded back. But the truth may not please you much either, he went on. What is the truth? We'll have to see. Your name is Julie? That's right. And you don't like being treated like a child? That's right. Then sit down and I'll question you as if you were an adult. I sat down. What brought you here, Julie? And please don't tell me my ad brought you. We're past that. What do you want? What are you doing here? I opened my mouth, but nothing flew out. Not a single syllable. I sat there, gaping for half a minute or so. Then I said to myself, What about the guy who was just here? Did you ask him what he wanted? 
Did you ask him what he was doing here? The gorilla did the strangest thing then. He took his right hand and put it straight across his eyes. Like he was starting to count for a game of hide and seek. The funny thing was, he wasn't actually touching his face. He was just holding his hand one inch from his nose, as if reading some tiny message written in his palm. I waited. After about two minutes, he lowered his hand and said, No, I did not ask him these things. I just sat there batting my eyelashes at him. The gorilla licked his lips, nervously it seemed to me. I think we can safely say that I'm not prepared to deal with the needs of a person your age. I think that can be safely said, yes. You mean you give up? Is that what you're telling me? You want me to go away because you give up? The gorilla stared at me. I couldn't tell whether he was staring hopefully or angrily or what. I said, don't you think a 12-year-old girl can have an earnest desire to save the world? I don't doubt it, he said. Though, it sounded like the words were pretty hard to get out. Then why won't you talk to me? Your end of the paper said you need a pupil. Isn't that what it said? That's what it said. Well, you've got one. Here I am. We lurch to the starting line. A long moment passed. I read that in a book once. A long moment passed. But this was a really long moment. Finally, the gorilla spoke again. Very well, he said with a nod. We'll begin and see where it takes us. My name is Ishmael. He seemed to expect a reaction of some kind, but to me this was just a noise. I, it would have been the same if he'd said his name was Whizbang. He already knew my name, so I just waited. Finally, he went on again. Referring to the young man who was just here. His name is... Alan Lomax, by the way. I said I didn't ask what he wanted, but I did ask him to tell a story that would explain why he was here. A story? Yes. I asked for his story. Now I ask for yours. I don't know what you mean by a story. Ishmael frowned as if he suspected I might be playing dumb. Maybe I was a little. He went on. Your classmates are doing something else this afternoon aren't they? Whatever they're doing, you're not doing it. Yeah, that's right. So, explain to me why you're not doing what your classmates are doing. How does your story differ from theirs that it brings you to this room on a Saturday afternoon? Now, I knew what he meant, but it didn't help. What story was he talking about? Did he want to hear about my folks' divorce? About my mom's adventures in boozing? About the problems I was having with Mrs. Monstro at school? About my former boyfriend, Donnie, the famous guy who wasn't? I want to understand what you're looking for, he said, answering these questions as if I'd spoken them aloud. I, I don't get it. I told him. The teachers I'm used to don't ask what you're looking for, they just teach what they teach. And is that what you were hoping to find here? A teacher like the ones you're used to? No, it wasn't. Then you're in luck, Julie, because I'm not like them. I'm what is called a myotic teacher. A myotic teacher is one who acts as a midwife to his pupils, or of course, her pupils. Do you know what a midwife is? A midwife is someone who helps a child birth, isn't that right? That's right. A midwife helps bring into the light an infant that has been growing inside its mother. A myotic teacher helps bring into the light ideas that have been growing inside his pupils. The gorilla stared at me intently while I thought about this. At last he went on. Do you think there are any ideas growing inside of you? I don't know, I told him. It was the truth. Do you think something is growing inside of you? I looked at him as blankly as I could. He was beginning to frighten me. Tell me this, Julie. Would you have come here two years ago if you'd seen my advertisement? That was easy. I told him no. So something has changed, he went on. Something inside of you. This is what I want to know about. I must understand what brought you here. I stared at him for a while. Then I said, 
Do you know what I say to myself all the time? I mean, all the time. 20 times a day, I say to myself, I've got to get out of here. Ishmael frowned, puzzling over this. I'll be taking a shower or washing the dishes or waiting for the bus, and that's what will pop into my head. I've got to get out of here. What does it mean? I don't know, he grunted. Of course you know. It means run for your life. Is your life in danger? Yes. From what? From everything. From people walking into school rooms with machine guns. From people bombing airplanes in hospitals. From people pumping nerve gas into us subways. From people dumping poison in the water we drink. From people cutting down the forest. From people destroying the ozone layer. I don't really know all this stuff because I don't want to listen. Do you know what I mean? I'm not sure. I mean, do you think I know what an ozone layer is? I don't. But they say we're poking holes in it, and if the holes get big enough, we're going to start dying like fries. They say the rainforests are like the planet's lungs, and if we cut them down, we'll suffocate. Do you think I know if this is right? I don't. One of my teachers said that as many as 200 species of plants and animals go extinct every day because of what we're doing to this planet. I remember that. I've got a good memory for stuff like that, but do you think I know if it's true? I don't. But I believe it. This same teacher says we're adding 15 million tons of carbon dioxide to the air every day. Do you think I know what that means? I don't. All I know is that carbon dioxide is a poison. I don't know where I saw it or heard it, but the suicide rate among teenagers has tripled in the last four years. Do you think I go looking for this stuff? I don't. But it jumps out at me anyway. People are eating the world alive. Ishmael nodded. So you've got to get out of here. That's right. Ishmael gave me a few seconds to think about that. Then he said, But this doesn't explain why you've come to see me. My ad doesn't say anything about getting out of here. Yeah, I know. It sounds like I'm not making any sense. Ishmael cocked an eyebrow at me. I've got to think about this, I told him. I got up and turned away to face the rest of the room. There wasn't much scope for sightseeing. Just those high, dusty windows, those pus-colored walls, and that tired-looking little bookcase at the other end. I headed for the bookcase. I could have saved myself the trip. There were a bunch of books on evolution, a bunch on history and prehistory, and a bunch of primitive peoples. There was a book on chimpanzee culture that looked interesting but nothing on gorillas. There were a couple of archaeological atlases. There was a book with the longest held I'd ever seen, something like Man's Rise to Civilization as shown by the Aboriginal peoples of the New World from prehistoric times to the coming of the Industrial State. There were three translations of the Bible, which seemed excessive for an ape. There was nothing I could curl up with in front of the fireplace, even if I had a fireplace. I poked around for as long as I could, then went back and sat down. You wanted me to tell you a story. I don't have a story to tell, but I've got a daydream. A daydream? Ishmael said, half a question. I nodded, and he said a daydream would do very well. Okay, this is what I was daydreaming about this morning. I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if I got down to room 105 of the Fairfield building and I went in there and there was this woman at the reception desk and she looked at me and, wait, Ishmael said, excuse me for interrupting. Yes? You're plunging. Plunging? Hurling, charging ahead, rushing. You mean I'm going too fast? Yes, much too fast. We're not working under a deadline here, Julie. If you intend to share this story with me, then please, let it unfold leisurely. As leisurely as it unfolded in your head this morning. Okay, I said. I see what you mean. You want me to start over? Yes, please. But no plunging this time. Take a moment. Gather your thoughts. Relax and let it come back to you. Don't summarize it for me. Tell it as it happened. Take a moment, relax, let it come back to me. He didn't seem to realize what he was asking for. I was sitting down, sure, but I couldn't sit back and be comfortable. Because if I did that, my feet would dangle over the edge and I'd feel like a six-year-old. I'd have to have my feet on the floor because I had to be ready to get out of there in half a second. 
And if you think you wouldn't feel that way, I suggest you just sit down toe-to-toe -to -toe with a full-grown gorilla and try it. The only way for me to relax and let the daydream come back was to curl up in a corner of the chair and close my eyes. And I just wasn't quite ready to do that in the presence of a thousand-pound ape. I gave Ishmael a sort of snooty, impatient scowl intended to convey all that. He took it in, mulled it over for a bit, and then did something that almost made me laugh out loud. He used two fingers to do a little swish over his heart, and then solemnly held them up for my inspection. Just like a boy scout, crossed my heart and hoped to die. What the hell? I did laugh out loud.